we can enjoy this weather for, I, I thought they said one more day before it drops. Okay, it is 12.45. Um, I'm gonna start the meeting. Uh, this is the Commission in Chicago Landmarks, our regular meeting. Uh, uh, today's date is April 13th. Um, I'd like to call the meeting to order and I'm gonna do the roll call. Um, Vice Chair, uh, Commissioner Jackowitz. Present. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Cox is not here. Commissioner Burns is not here. Commissioner Fair. Present, I can see and hear you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Commissioner Hughes. Present, I can see and hear you. Thank you, Commissioner Ponce. Present, I can see and hear you. Great, Commissioner Rubin. Present, and I can see and hear you. Thank you, and Commissioner Tolliver. Present, I can see and hear you. Thank you so much. Okay, here we go. Maybe this might be the last time I read this. Um, in 2020, Governor Prisker signed Public Act 101-0640, making certain amendments to the Open Meetings Act so that we, along with other boards and commissions, can continue to host virtual meetings during the COVID-19 public health emergency, provided that certain conditions are met. One of those conditions is that I, as head of the Commission in Chicago Landmarks, determined that an in-person meeting of the Commission on Chicago Landmarks and its Permit Review Committee are not practical or prudent. I want to make sure our virtual meeting meets all the conditions of the Open Meetings Act as amended. Therefore, I'm making a determination pursuant to Section 7E2 of the Open Meetings Act that an in-person meeting of this Commission on Chicago Landmarks and its Permit Review Committee is not practical or prudent. Similarly, I'm making a determination pursuant to Section 7E5 that because of the, of the disasters declared by the governor, it is unfeasible for at least one member of the Commission on Chicago Landmarks or its chief administrative officer or its chief legal officer to be physically present at the meeting place for either meeting. Pursuant to a resolution adopted by the Commission on Chicago Landmarks on June 4th, 2020, regarding the chairman's emergency rulemaking powers, I issued emergency rules governing the conduct of remote public commission meetings and provisions for remote public participation effective February 18th, 2022. These rules are posted on the commission's website. In line with these emergency rules, today's regular commission meeting is a virtual meeting being simulcast to the general public via live streaming. Commission meetings have been held virtually since May of 2020. Meetings are structured to minimize the chances for technical difficulties. Members of the general public have been encouraged to submit written statements in advance of the meetings and these have been posted on the commission's website and are available for viewing during the virtual meeting at www.chicago.gov ccl. Per their emergency rules, verbal statements by the general public for all agenda items will take place at the beginning of the meeting. So, um, so all those wishing to speak at today's meeting should be signed into the Zoom meeting at this time. Before we hear staff presentations and agenda items, after which we will ask to hear from owners or applicants and their teams, we will open the floor up to members of the general public who wish to consent to comment 
about the items to be heard in today's agenda. Comments should pertain only to the agenda items. Members of the public wishing to comment should use the raise hand function on Zoom to indicate that they wish to speak. Members of the public not connecting via computer or smartphone and instead phoning into meeting should press star nine to activate the raise hand function and do the same to deactivate it. I or the meeting facilitator will call out names one by one and unmute those people. Once unmuted, speakers should give their full name and organization, if any, they represent. Each speaker is allocated three minutes to speak. Once all members of the public wishing to make a comment have been given an opportunity to do so, we'll go through the agenda. I'll ask that owners or applicants and their representatives, as well as aldermen, wait to speak until after the staff presentations have been made on their agenda item. We'll call on you then. So, are there members of the general public who would like to make comments about agenda item two, the final landmark recommendation for the Appworth Church Building located at 5253 North Kenmore Avenue? Who do we have? We have uh, three people, Chairman, uh, four now. And the okay. first one is uh, Mr. Ward Miller. Okay, Ms. Miller, the floor is yours. Oh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? We sure can, thank you. Um, well, good afternoon uh, to all of you members of the Commission on Chicago Landmarks. I'm Ward Miller, Executive Director of Preservation Chicago. We at Preservation Chicago fully support the final landmark recommendation in the Chicago landmark designation of the Epworth United Methodist Church Building, along with the adjoining parish house and community structure located at 5253 North Kenmore Avenue. We are of the opinion that the Epworth Church Building Complex is an outstanding example of unique building style designed and constructed over time by a series of architects which already have designated Chicago landmark buildings attributed to their work. These architects include Frederick B. Townsend in 1890 and also Theobar and Fugard's 1930s additions to the church complex. Uh, it was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 2008 some 15 years ago, and also this is an orange rated building in the Chicago Historic Resources Survey published in 1996, some 27 years ago. So in our professional opinion, this church complex has already met many of the strict criteria and thresholds of historic building worthy of a Chicago landmark des designation. In addition to its architectural legacy, Epworth has an amazing history linked to the early settlers of the Edgewater community, including John Lewis Cochran, known as the founding father of Edgewater, and continuing its legacy to its most recent years as an important resource and cornerstone of the community. This house of worship has also provide, provided all sorts of humanitarian and outreach services to the community for decades, including housing and overnight shelter for those less fortunate. We at Preservation Chicago have worked with the Edgewater Historical Society, members of Epworth Church, and both Alderman Harry Osterman and Dan Luna for many years on preservation issues in the Edgewater community. And during that same time, also sharing our long-term concerns for the Epworth Church complex, noting its diminishing congregation size and change in leadership over the last few years. With this incredible history, architecture, and outreach noted, we at Preservation Chicago fully support the Chicago landmark designation of the Epworth Church Building and Parish House Complex. And with all the protection of the complex's facades, towers, roof lines, and art glass windows, including the museum quality Healy and Malay arched window on its principal elevation fronting Kenmore Avenue. We'd also like consideration be given uh, to the green spaces in and around Epworth Church, uh, which maintain the sight lines to the church building on its south facade, as well as the uh, west elevation of the parish house, its primary elevation. These are very all very important aspects of the designation and seeing the church. It also provides some light and air and a gardening space for the community, which is so important. So we highly recommend this designation of Epworth Memorial uh, Church in Chicago. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Uh, Our next speaker, speaker is uh, Bruce Green. Okay, Mr. Green. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? We sure can. Awesome, thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Bruce Green. I was a member of Epworth for nearly two decades. From 2003 until 2019, I served as president of the Board of Trustees and as church historian. 
I completed my undergrad work at Eastern Michigan University in Architectural History and Historic Preservation and interned for two terms as recording secretary for the Ypsilanti Historic District Commission, which is the state of Michigan's second largest historic district. I am in favor of the landmark status being conferred upon Epworth Church building. Epworth Church was built approximately at the midway point between Chicago Methodist Temple and First Methodist Church of Evanston. Both noted churches gave grants and then loans to finance Epworth's construction. It is the largest Methodist edifice along Chicago's North Lake Shore. John Cochran, a local real estate developer, gave the 100 by 150 foot lot. William Gowdy, a well-known railroad lawyer and whose name bears, uh, is born on the local elementary school, gave $1,000 gave $1, in 1890 for the building of Epworth. Frederick Townsend, the architect, well-known for his later five houses on Avers Avenue, which is already a Chicago landmark, did the work pro bono and also gave substantial money. The building is a vernacular form of Richardsonian Romanesque built of Wisconsin glacial erratics. This very unusual and unique building material is not found within the city. Church history suggests that the material was removed from the farm of founding members, Mr. and Mrs. Lewis Slocum, their farm in Geneva, Wisconsin, Illinois, and floated by barge via waterway. Pictures exist of the stones being offloaded onto the property from a barge that was uh, dug, uh, transported via slip uh, on Lake Michigan. There are Masonic symbols found on the building's exterior and interior, many of the, which have been obscured by time to the untrained eye from the placement of the main tower, the order of Eastern star found in its glass, to the keyholes found in the original exterior and interior truss work. These symbols are amazing. By the 1920s, Epworth had grown its out, outgrown its facility. No, the noted firm of Theobar and Fugard were attained and renovated and expanded the building. This well-known firm also designed such group buildings as the, in the Chicago sky, skyline as the Jewelers Building, the McGraw Hill Building, and the Trustee System Services Building. John Fugard was not only a Methodist but a Mason. This renovated the physical plant to 42,000 square feet the sanctuary seating 650 people, and the sympathetic community house addition. Epworth Building has been a vital part of the North Lakefront community for almost 135 years. It's worthy to be called a Chicago landmark. Thank, Thank you. you Ms. Thank you, Mr. Green. Our next speaker is Preservation Chicago. Hi, it's Mary Lou Seidel. Can you hear me okay? We sure can. Thanks, Mary Lou. Thank you, Chairman Wong. My name is Mary Lou Seidel. I'm the Director of Community Engagement at Preservation Chicago. And I also want to add to what Ward said about Epworth Church. You know, for over 130 years, this church has been an important anchor in the Edgewater community. As Bruce spoke of the transportation of large boulders from Wisconsin via, you know, ship to Chicago is such a remarkable history. But What's beyond, this place is important because of its architecture and because of the, the towers and because of the construction, but it's important because of that role as an anchor to the community and to the congregants. I really want to thank Commissioner Maurice Cox and the Department of Planning staff and the Commission on Chicago Landmarks for hearing the call on the importance of this building and it's the threat of imminent demolition in enacting um, the process to name it an, a landmark. So thank you all for your time and your support and uh, yay for Epworth Church. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Killian Walsh. Killian. Hi, thank you for holding. Uh, my name is Killian Walsh. Um, I'm with Edgewater Historical Society, mm -hmm. and I'm also a neighbor with Epworth Church around the corner from me. Uh, the architecture of the church is a rare example of fieldstone architecture in Chicago using an uncoursed granite boulders in its wall construction. 
Uh, the final, uh, the method of construction requires a high degree of design and craftsmanship in traditional masonry. It's a piece of art. Uh, the final service at the church was on May 15, 2022. If Epworth was a body part, it would be the heart of the Kenmore and Berwyn area. Even after the congregation left uh, the, in December, it still holds a men's shelter and has an active garden plot area for the neighbors to grow vegetables and herbs. It continues to thrive. Built above ground level, it can be seen from a block away on its majestic, in its majestic construction and the gateway from Sheridan to the Berwyn train stop. You can count on seeing Epworth. It was a vibrant church, then came COVID, and it never recovered from the loss of the congregation population. No more community plays, organ music, children scattering in the yard, neighbors taking care of the lawn, men from the shelter cleaning up the area, just to name a few. Landmarking the stated structure is important because of its potential for, of this church for a buyer and readapt and reuse the church is noteworthy. noteworthy. Everybody wants to help the church to sell its property. Not only are their neighbors looking, so is Edgewater Historical Society, but Ward Miller, ED of Landmark Chicago, the busiest man in Chicago, will call and be excited of a possible buyer. It really has a bill. We want the church owners to win, as well as the community. It hasn't been easy for the church and its congregation. I'd like to right the wrong. Over here by Epworth, teardowns are breathing down our back. So please secure this as a landmarking. Say yes to landmarking and we'll take care of it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Walsh. Is there anybody else that has signed up to speak in this? Yes, uh, we have next speaker is Tom. Okay. Yes, this is uh, Tom Green. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, Tom. Yes, this is Tom Green, local Edgewater architect and founder and current board member of the Edgewater Historical Society. I support the final landmarking designation of this unique and amazing large boulder stone landmark in our community. And I hope this moves fast and moves forward so we can get this passed and have a landmark building in our community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Green. Uh, no other hands raised, Chairman. Wonderful. Okay. Um, are there members of the general public uh, who'd like to comment on agenda item number three, the preliminary landmark recommendation for the warehouse located at 206 South Jefferson? Uh, we have uh, Max Chavez. Okay. Mr. Chavez? Hi there. Can you hear me? Yeah, we sure can. All right, uh, good afternoon to the commission and landmark staff. Um, this is Max Chavez. I'm director of research and special projects at Preservation Chicago. Uh, I am so overjoyed to have the opportunity to be speaking with you today about the warehouse at 206 South Jefferson. Uh, I'm sure there will be plenty of passionate and touching testimony today about this one of a kind place, especially uh, considering the incredible outpouring of letters submitted on behalf of the warehouse this week. Uh, I can't wait to hear more from the public. So I thought I would just uh, touch on the campaign and effort to have this building land marked and, and talk about the monumental show of support we've seen. Uh, just last month, Preservation Chicago listed the warehouse as one of the most endangered sites in the city after learning it had been recently sold and marketed as a redevelopment opportunity. Uh, as we all know now, this humble, albeit beautiful building is a site of massive worldwide significance that stretches far beyond the boundaries of Chicago. Opened in 1977 by its owner, Robert Williams, the warehouse was Williams' attempt at creating a nightlife experience on par with the best clubs that New York City had to offer. And in doing so, Williams hired his friend, uh, Frankie Knuckles, as the warehouse's resident DJ. It was there at the warehouse that Frankie Knuckles honed a sound that fused disco and soul, gospel, and electronica all together into something entirely new, a, a sound that was indescribable because it quite literally did not have a name yet. Eventually, uh, a name did stick, one that derived from the club itself, and it was forever called House Music. House Music was so invigorating and so groundbreaking, so inspiring to people that Chicago could only contain it for so long. It spread from Jefferson Street to living rooms to radios to even more dance floors, and by then it was unstoppable. House Music didn't just enter the world, it changed it. 
it's impossible to fully describe what house means to people, but I think we have a pretty good idea because after the announcement, uh, the immediate response was staggering. Our change.org petition racked up over 13,000 signatures in just a few weeks, many coming from as far away as Japan, Colombia, India, and Jamaica, just to name a few. The warehouse just this weekend was on the front page of the Chicago Tribune and was also covered in many publications locally, nationally, and internationally. The voice of house heads and music lovers around the world was clear and resounding. The warehouse must be an official Chicago landmark. The warehouse is that perfect Chicago story, and it captures what makes the city so exceptional. This was an underground space that began by welcoming a queer and Black community to the dance floor during the waning days of disco. It was a sanctuary, and out of this sanctuary came something with a global appeal. Chicago is a city of diverse communities and boundless creativity and an influence on the world, and nowhere is this better represented than the warehouse. So now is the time to honor the warehouse and Frankie Knuckles and the house sound that has shaped everything that came after it. Um, so thank you very much, commissioners, and, and two quick thanks first to the landmark staff that worked so quickly and meticulously to get the warehouse to this preliminary landmarking stage. We would not be here without that dedication. Um, and secondly, a huge thanks to just the general public. Your passion and heart have touched all of us, um, and it's because of you that the warehouse is receiving its due attention. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chavez. Who's the next speaker? Next speaker is Maurice Shaker. Okay. Good afternoon, Mr. Wong, and to the committee. Uh, thank you very much for taking this here um, item up on your agenda list for review. Um, I am a member that was at the warehouse at its inception in 1977 and um, very dear friends with Frankie Knuckles and Robert Williams. Robert Williams being the architect of bringing a uh, establishment here to the city and Frankie Knuckles for being the musical maestro and resident DJ that created a sound using all of the elements that the gentleman who just spoke um, did. And uh, subsequently, the birth of a sound, a genre, and a social community has came out of this city. Um, I have did interviews with people in reference to this here uh, on a global level right here, and everybody wants to come and see the birthplace. So I'd like to just put my um, information to the committee to let them know that it's a very, very real thing. Uh, the district and where it's at now, it's nothing like what it was once upon a time, but due to um, progress, uh, it's up and coming. But I do believe that this is definitely one of the uh, tourist sites that is of a global nature, that people come to Chicago to see, especially your househead community of the birthplace and sound of this here. I think it'll be a great justice for the city as well as for the black and gay community when it started out, because those were who, <clears throat> those were the architects of this here establishment. Um, it was a sanctuary for all, um, welcoming, um, and like no other place in the city of Chicago. And still to this here date, there's nothing like the warehouse in the city of Chicago. So the memory of the warehouse should linger on and it should be designated and looked upon as something very great. Another yet musical genre out of the city of Chicago. City of Chicago is um, boast, can boast for several musical genres that are known in a global nature. Why not house music? With that, I'll um, finish up so that you can take on another call. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chater. Our next, next speaker. speaker is Celeste Alexander. Okay. Are you all able to hear me? We sure can. Hi, and thank you for having me and listening out. Uh, my name is DJ Celeste Alexander. Um, I am um, actually one of, uh, Frankie Knuckles is one of my mentors um, as a DJ. I've been a DJ and one of Chicago's first female DJs in the house music community for the last 42 years. Um, please accept my um, sentiment, my high sentiment and endorsement for the designation of the warehouse as a Chicago um, landmark. It is my hope that the designation becomes a reality. Our great city, so rich in culture, should recognize all of the brilliance and status and diversity and, and as it has on countless levels. Preservation, preservation of unique contributions in art, diverse cultures, architecture, history, all combined with the essence that makes Chicago so great, can and should meet the mark of pre pre preserving 
our musical culture as well. The blues, jazz, gospel, and house are all rooted in the rich fabric of our city. The warehouse is where the culture of house and now genre of house um, is where it all began and where, where, where house music got its name. The space, this, offer, um, this, offered, this place offered a haven to our diverse African-American LGBTQ plus community and anyone who sought the joy of music. It was the place of freedom and release for thousands of people over the years and birthed a musical genre recognized all over the world. When the world rejoices in house music, it looks to Chicago for its history. When cultures want to find out more about the roots of house music, it comes to Chicago for the story. The world honors Chicago as the birthplace of this unique and thriving music and culture. Chicago would do a great disservice to itself by not honoring, honoring it as well. The warehouse is this place. Although our community has different designation as a reminder of house music, of the house music community and the importance of our culture, such as honorary street signs and special day designations for the founders, our culture, um, of our culture, we do not have a building, a space, a place that can give a starting point of its origins. 206 South Jefferson is that place. It is ours, it is rich, and it deserves to be designated and preserved as such. The house, the history of house music and the culture of the community that is so well loved and cherished in Chicago should have a designation where people can see where it all began and not allow this part of our history to fall by the wayside and fade away. I encourage you to save our birthplace so the history of our origins will always be available for future generations to be told. Thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you, DJ Celeste. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Avi Kamionsky. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Avi Kamiansky, and um, I am a co-owner of 206 South Jefferson. Um, we purchased 206 South Jefferson with the intent to use it as an office and have no intent to tear it down. Um, it's currently being used as an office space. There's offices on both floors, and our intent is to keep using it as an office to house our law firm. My partner, Schneer Nathan, and I, as well as several attorneys in our law firm, are alumni of Chicago Kent Law School and are excited to have our firm housed across the street from our alma mater, which is directly across the street at Jefferson and Adams. Um, we've recently come to learn about the history of the building and are continuing to learn about it. And we'd like to work with the commission on this issue and we are not looking to impede anything of cultural significance. Um, we're intending to do an interior refresh, paint, carpet, moving around some walls, a bathroom. And we're trying to get it done by September 1 because our current lease is expiring. Um, we hope we can get it all done in time, and uh, it's cool to hear all about the history of the building from all these people on today. Thank you, uh, Ms. Kamianski. Next speaker. Our, our next speaker is Michael Ball. Okay. Can you hear me? You sure can. Oh, hi. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Ball. I'm um, Artist Relations Director for uh, major festivals and events domestically and internationally. Um, I also own and operate one of the largest recording studios at uh, Chicago Music Garage. Uh, it's become an incubator for many artists, uh, use it as a, a, a place where they can come and produce music. And um, they've all had many successful uh, singles signed and uh, it's been pretty uh, a pretty great run. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank uh, Ward Miller, the Executive Director of uh, Preservation Chicago. Uh, and his entire staff for all their hard work, um, as well as um, the uh, Commission on Chicago Landmarks for allowing us to our voices to be heard uh, and hosting this most important meeting. <clears throat> um, I'm a Chicagoan, born and raised, 400 East Randolph. Um, another address that you guys might be familiar with, uh, 4339 South Lake Park Avenue in the uh, Kenwood neighborhood. It's home of uh, Chicago blues legend Muddy Waters. I was giving, given historical status a few years back. Now, 206 South Jefferson, also the home of sorts to the godfather of house music. Um, as this address where house music was both born and raised. Um, also, it was a safe house for disenfranchised LGBTQ community at a time where there weren't many options, really, uh, aside from maybe a few. Um, house music, it's considered to be the original electronic music genre from 
uh, house music uh, it paved the way for over 3,000 subgenres um, and, and counting. Um, there are billions, billions of fans worldwide, and all stems from house music, which started here in Chicago at the warehouse. Um, uh, the warehouse, it's, uh, it's, it's like the Vatican, it's like the mecca of house music. Um, uh, I implore you and then the commission to please preserve this historical property, not only for Chicago, but, uh, but for the entire planet. And uh, thank you for your time today. Thank you, Mr. Ball. Is there a next speaker? Our, our next speaker is Rolf Achilles. Mr. Achilles? I was actually on hold for um, Epworth. Oh. I didn't get recognized then, but I'm all in favor of supporting house music. I've been there a number of times in the past, and I think it should become a landmark. So thank you. Thank you. Our, our last speaker is, uh, sorry, Frederick Dunson. Frederick? Are you there? Uh, hello, can you yes. hear me? Yeah, Ms. Dunson, you. go ahead. Thank you. Hi, my name is Frederick Dunson, and I am the president and the executive director of uh, the Frankie Knuckles Foundation, as well as a former employee um, at U.S. Studio, the warehouse. I, uh, like so many others, when we heard about this um, possible situation, um, was dismayed at um, the possibility of the building being destroyed. Um, it, I'm sorry, it, it, it was a safe place for marginalized black and brown queer individuals who had no place to go when they were discriminated against by clubs in River North and, the, and on the North side when other outlets wasn't available for them. The origin of the music played at 206 South Jefferson has become a musical genre that has become worldwide and synonymous with Chicago. Grammy winning award DJ Frankie Knuckles has become one of music industries and most influential persons even after his passing and the first to be recognized by the Grammy Awards in the genre of house music. Underground clubs such as 206 has become the model for clubs worldwide and the architecture of the building itself is unique and unlike any other. So we join with Preservation Chicago in partnering and spreading the word and helping get 206 the landmark designation that it, it certainly deserves. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. Uh, that's all the hands we have had. Okay. All right. Um, are there members of the general public who would like to come in on agenda item number four, the preliminary landmark recommendation for the Century Building located at 202 South State Street? We have uh, Joe Shanahan. Okay, Shanahan. The floor is yours. Hi, can you hear me, sir? Yes, be sure can. Go yes, ahead. I'm. I'm uh, commenting today on the warehouse project. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioner, oh. and thank you for including me today. My name is Joe Shanahan. I'm the founder of two Chicago music venues, Metro and Smart Bar which alongside my great team, we have dedicated the last 40 years to music development and culture commitment to our great city. I'm also a founding member and president of the advisory committee for the Frankie Knuckles Foundation, whose mission is dedicated to the advancement of house music, LGBTQ concerns, youth homelessness, AIDS research, and prevention of diabetes and research education. I join my colleagues today, Preservation Chicago, to urge the Department of Planning and Development of Historic Preservation Division and the Commission of Chicago Landmarks to protect 206 South Jefferson by granting its landmark status. This address is known by many Chicagoans as the warehouse. It is, it is a significant and is not only to the Chicago heritage, but to a global audience. It is one of the most endangered addresses, as I understand it, and vulnerable to dem demolition. 
We must move forward now to preserve the warehouse for generations to come. The lo location is also personally influential to me and significant to me because the music landscape at the time was barren here in Chicago. Metro and Smart Bar do not exist without the warehouse. I've been in business for 40 years and I've seen many clubs open and clo close in the city of Chicago. I was lucky to have walked into 206 South Jefferson in the early 80s. I gravitated, gravitated towards it because I also heard about a DJ who was shifting DJ culture as we knew it across the country, but most specifically here in Chicago. That DJ was Frankie Knuckles. He used to have the Chicago, Chicago Jefferson address to create a musical and cultural hub, a safe space for all walks of life. All who came together under this one roof to dance and celebrate life. Amazingly, we did not know at the time what we were witnessing. Frankie was creating an entirely new genre all together with his DJ sets, what is now known as house music. It is also the birthplace of house as uh, other people have stated today. The warehouse at 206 South Jefferson is the birthplace of house and should be protected. It is a vital home to the connection of Chicago's cultural history. And I've always been honored to say Frankie Knuckles would be a frequent smart bar patron and eventually became our first resident DJ, a legendary residency that would last for 28 years, bringing and still bringing 40 years of DJ culture to Chicago today. My story, along with many other Chicagoans, all circles back to a crucial role that this played. I urge the Department of Planning and Development to step up and protect this cultural landmark. Thank you, Mr. Shanahan. Uh, for the record, could uh, you uh, indicate that Mr. Shanahan was speaking on, on item number uh, three, uh, the warehouse? Also, for the record, that um, Rolf Achilles was uh, speaking on item number two, the Upworth Church building. Is there a next speaker? Is there a speaker in the Century building at 202 South State? The next speaker is Dirk Lohan. Yes. Mr. Lohan. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. We sure can. Yeah. Uh, I'm uh, submitting these comments to you today in my capacity as a longtime architect in Chicago who worked on the original design of the Dirksen Federal Building in the 1960s with the architect Nies van der Rohe, who also happens to be my grandfather. As such, I am representing the Mies van der Rohe Society and the American Institute of Architects Chicago chapter, which have both agreed to advocate the landmarking of the Century Building and the Consumers Building, both located along State Street on the same block that houses the Dirksen Federal Building. These two early skyscrapers are fine examples of Chicago's architectural heritage and should be landmarked to give them the protection they deserve. These two buildings belong into the League of the Reliance Building, the Monadnock Building, and the Marquette Buildings in Chicago. They are of that quality and should be recognized forever. At the time of the design of the Federal Center, they were successfully occupied and were carefully respected by Mies van der Rohe as part of the urban composition he developed between Adams and Jackson Street. Later, they were acquired by the federal government and were left unoccupied without any mean, uh, meaningful uh, maintenance. Today, they are neglected and deteriorating to the point that the State Street sidewalk must be fenced in to protect the public from being hit by falling facade elements. The current condition of these buildings is of deep concern and the suggestion that to, test, to tear them down is a disgrace and should uh, and insult 
to the proud history of Chicago's architectural significance. They should be landmarked and the GSA, the current owner, should be allowed, should not be allowed to tear them down. Indeed, and instead, a qualified and experienced architectural team should be commissioned to clean up the urbanistic plan, which will integrate the eastern half of the property behind the Dirksen building as an integral and aesthetically attractive solution to the entire block between Dearborn and State Streets. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lawhon. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Adam Nathan Sean. Hello, can you hear me? We sure can. Wonderful. Hello, my name is Adam Nathan Schoen, Director of Operations for Preservation Chicago. We wish to thank the city of Chicago for including Century and consumers on the agenda today. Preservation Chicago strongly supports their Chicago landmark designation and adaptive reuse. As Chicago seven most endangered in 2011, 2013, 2022, and again in 2023, this has been a very long effort. But today we have the opportunity to finally set these buildings on a good path. These significant early Chicago skyscrapers are endangered by a misguided $52 million earmark for their demolition. Support for preservation is broad and deep. It includes many elected officials, civic leaders, the editorial boards of major Chicago newspapers. The B1M documentary has been viewed over 1.2 million times. Our change.org petition has over 23,500 signatures. Printed out, these signatures would cover 501 pages, literally a ream of paper. But yet the march towards demolition continues. At the request of this commission, the landmark staff generated a lengthy report detailing the history and significance of century consumers. The findings were overwhelming and definitively proved that these buildings are landmark eligible, yet the march continues. Chicago's early Chicago skyscrapers are currently under consideration for UNESCO World Heritage Site. If the centuries and consumers were to be demolished, it could jeopardize eligibility for this extraordinary designation, recognition, and tourism, but yet the march continues. The primary justification for demolition, that a residential use is incompatible with courthouse security is no longer relevant as the Chicago Collaborative Archive Center plan is a win-win alternative that meets or exceeds the security requirements. Its stakeholders include 20 national archives and universities, and yet the march continues. So where is the disconnect? Why the relentless march towards demolition despite all the compelling reasons to change course? I can think of 52 million reasons, Words alone are powerless to stop the $52 million earmark for demolition. The city of Chicago needs to change the terms of the federal funding. And to do so, the city of Chicago needs to take action, strong, clear, resolute action. Once the city of Chicago clearly states, these are Chicago landmarks, the hope is that the same officials who earmark the funds will add two little words, when the $52 million can be used for demolition or renovation, then a truly creative, open, collaborative process can begin. We should thank the commission, the department and staff for all the work you do to advance healthy communities in Chicago by leveraging the power of historic preservation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nainshaw. Our speaker. next speaker is Kendra Barza. Okay. Kendra, are you with us? Yes, apologies, can you hear me? We sure can. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, so um, Chairman Wong, with your permission, I'd like to speak to both items four and five on today's agenda, which seems to be <laughs> the, the precedent here. Um, Thank you. Good okay, great. Uh, my, good afternoon, um, members of the commission. My name is Kendra Parzin. I am the advocacy manager for Landmarks Illinois. I am here today to express our wholehearted support for the landmark designation of the Century Building at 202 South State Street and the Consumers Building at 220 South State Street. Um, we are so thrilled to see these landmark designations come back on the Commission's agenda, uh, and we thank this, the Commission and the City for their willingness to revisit them. 
While we would like to state again, as we have in the past, that we do not dismiss the legitimate security concerns of the occupants of the federal courthouse, demolition of the Century and Consumers Buildings is a net negative for Chicago. Uh, we do not believe that demolition is the only solution to alleviate security concerns. Uh, security can and should be prioritized in the building's adaptive reuse through design, construction, and operations. Those conversations are difficult, while demolition still appears to be the preferred option of the GSA and of the federal court. We understand that conversations about reuse possibilities and security solutions are still ongoing, uh, and we also recognize that local landmark designation ultimately may not prevent the GSA from demolishing these buildings. Nevertheless, uh, it adds an additional layer of protection and demonstrates the city of Chicago's interest and intentions to see these structures reimagined and restored. Uh, we note the stipulation identified in today's agenda that allows the commission greater leeway to approve modifications to these buildings in order to address security concerns. Um, and we find that to be appropriate and are hopeful that it will support our shared goal of finding creative solutions uh, to support the reuse of these buildings. So thank you for considering our comments and we very much look forward to seeing these landmark designations advance. Thank you, Ms. Person. Our next speaker is Jennifer Washington. Hi, Washington. thank you for uh, allowing me to speak this morning. Um, my name is Jennifer Washington and I am a writer and producer of the feature length documentary God Said Give Them Drum Machines about the true black origins of techno music in Detroit. Our story connects what was happening in Detroit to what was happening in Chicago with Frankie Knuckles and house music. Uh, we were actually able to film the exterior of the warehouse and it is highlighted in our film. We are grateful to have been able to use this footage to support and help bring to life this very important part of music history, especially when so many of the other buildings like this in Detroit have been since torn down. Um, thank you um, for letting me speak. Uh, thank you, Ms. Washington. For the record, could you indicate that um, Ms. Washington was speaking on uh, item number four, which is the where or item number three, the warehouse. Um, we are currently on item number four, the century uh, building. And also for the record, if you could indicate the last three speakers uh, were speaking on behalf of both item number four and item number five. Next speaker, please. Uh, next speaker is B.H. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, um, thank you. My name is Brian Harrington. I'm a resident um, and just want to make this quick, but uh, I'm speaking on item, our agenda items four and five, the Century and Consumer Buildings. Uh, I agree with everything that the past three speakers for these agenda items um, noted as well and wanted to bring up a quick uh, view at how these have impacted the architectural legacy of downtown Chicago. They represent um, a time where, you know, building materials, uh, you know, were strongly, mostly stone, terracotta, particularly for the, the century building. And we don't really see much of that going on these days, mostly due to cost. There's a, um, I know the at 400 North Lakeshore Drive, they had uh, proposed a building with terracotta and much of that was value engineered out. So in this day and age, it's very unlikely we'll see buildings of this of this type rise in our in our city core. Um, so wanted to kind of focus on how you know we're, we're likely not going to see buildings like this be built yeah, in our in our lifetimes, hopefully. But uh, very important to the architectural legacy of Chicago um, and show us an example of you know a time where that that those building materials were were more common and frankly, uh, more economically viable. Also, uh, speaking to the security concerns of the federal building, uh, I, I, you know, I understand that there's $52 million earmarked for the demolition, and I agree that they could use that for renovation. Hopefully, they could also use that to, you know, 
board up windows for courthouses or wherever the, you know, in the actual federal building or maybe bulletproof fogged glass, something along those lines. It seems like there's more creative solutions here. But um, yeah, it, it's embarrassing as a member of the local community to see these buildings be de demolished. So very, very much in favor for the preliminary landmark status. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harrington. Our next, next speaker. speaker is Ward Miller. Mr. Miller. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the Commission on Chicago Landmarks. I'm Ward Miller. You can hear me clearly, right? We can. Yes, we at Preservation Chicago, as you've heard, enthusiastically support the preliminary landmark recommendation for the Century and Consumers buildings uh, in the very heart of downtown Chicago. Both buildings are important contributing structures and vital components of the Loop Retail National Register Historic District. They are also uh, designed by two of Chicago's most notable architectural firms, Halliburton and Roche and Jenny Mundy and Jensen, and both firms are recognized on the world stage for their commissions and world-renowned landmark buildings. The Century and Consumers buildings designed by our architects Halliburton and Roche and Jenny Mundy and Jensen are also the culmination of the Chicago School of Architecture and a significant period of Chicago's development beginning in 1885 and continuing to about 1915 when the Century and Consumers buildings were constructed. And one could call this Chicago's first golden age of architecture, spanning some 30 years to the beginnings of World War I. Many of the early technologies employed in these two seminal buildings and of the Chicago School of Architecture in these early skyscrapers are still part of skyscraper and superstructure skyscraper design employed around the world today. And many are still designed and conceived by our architectural firms in Chicago. The vertical expression of both the Century and Consumers buildings are remarkable and even relate to the buildings by Ludwig Mies van der Rohe and the Chicago Federal Center behind, not only for their vertical expression exhibited on their terracotta facades, but also for their content uh, to one of Mies's most important public commissions in both um, in, in most important commissions. Uh, in both the Century and Consumers buildings, one can observe the extraordinary achievements of the collective evolution of the Chicago skyscraper in relationship and in close proximity to Mises Federal Center, designed some 50 years later. Our designated landmarks are viewed as world treasures, and the Century and Consumers buildings are among the great buildings of Chicago, which should be recognized as official Chicago landmarks. We just want to say in closing that, you know, there was a time when the Reliance building uh, was in a severe state of uh, disrepair for more than 50 years, and that building at State in Washington is now a, a wonderful example of what uh, Chicago skyscrapers, those early skyscrapers can be, and we think that this can again happen with these two corner buildings, uh, very similar in design and, and composition. So we want to thank the city, uh, Commission on Chicago Landmarks, DPD staff, uh, and everybody involved uh, in making these two buildings uh, designate Chicago landmarks. And of course, I'm speaking on both item number four and five together. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Next speaker. Our next speaker is Holly Fiedler. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I'm here to speak about items four and uh, five. Commission on Chicago Landmarks. Uh, thank you. My name is Holly Fiedler, and I'm a member of the board of the Chicago Collaborative Archives Center. We ask you to grant preliminary landmark to both the Century and Consumers Buildings, 202 South State Street, the Century Building by Halliburton and Roche, is a 16-story steel frame building completed in 1915. 220 South Street, the Consumers Building by Jenny Mundy and Jensen, completed in 1913, is a 22-story steel superstructure. <laughs> William LeBaron Jenny was the father of the skyscraper. Both have impressive terracotta surfaces. They are part of Chicago's architectural legacy. Look, Ludwig Mies van der Rohe designed the Chicago Federal Center, including the Dirksen Courthouse, with the built environment in mind. This included the Century and Consumers buildings built by his predecessors. Since the acquisition by the GSA in 2005, the buildings have been deteriorating, 
deteriorating due to deferred maintenance and vacancy. The CCAC, the Chicago Collaborative Archive Center, is offering a vision for a positive alternative that would restore the buildings to meet federal security needs. The CCAC mission statement is, the Chicago Collaborative Archive Center is an organization committed to identify and purchase buildings to create a collaborative archive in the Chicago area. The CCAC board would be responsible for managing and ensuring integrity and safeguarding the operation in perpetuity. This shared archival facility creates an economy of scale, professional interaction, and a central repository for scholars. The urgency for this critical need is underscored by the closure and or merger of many religious communities and other associations to include um, from the region non-religious centers. The CCAC is proposing a national archive center that would employ um, archival standards to preserve unique and irreplaceable collections. The demolition of these buildings would be a disservice to the history of Chicago architecture, lost to the downtown economy and future positive endeavors. It would likely remove Chicago's nomination of early Chicago skyscrapers to become a UNESCO World Heritage Center. This would be a significant loss to the city for tourism, which brings money and interest to the city. You can help prevent demolition by formally recognizing the historical value of these buildings. The CCAC thanks the Commission on Chicago Landmarks for the considerable past review of these two buildings in July and September of 2022. We ask you to step up and formally recognize the historic value. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fiedler. Next speaker. Our, our next speaker is Malaki McCarthy. Can you hear me? Yes. I want to thank the key, the commission for considering uh, items four and five, the Century and Consumers Building. Um, my interest is really looking at it as a, the housing of the Chicago Collaborative Archive Center. I think this is a very wonderful marriage of historic preservation and a marriage where historical records uh, can be kept. I think the big challenge that archivists have always faced is that um, they never had a place that was a collaborative center where uh, there could be professional interaction among archivists, uh, shared um, electronic facilities. And what we are envisioning is a very innovative and unique approach to getting all these underserved and marginalized archives into one place. Uh, Holly had mentioned the fact that a lot of religious communities are facing completion and the uh, Catholic religious women especially were the, uh, created the superstructure for many urban areas and were the anchors for the uh, ethnic communities. And that is um, what was one of, the, one of the organizations that could be housed in this facility. Uh, we have been working with the federal ju judiciary and the GSA. And one of the things I have to say is that because archives are highly secure buildings, um, they need stack areas which are, don't need light. So the concerns of the west facing walls of these buildings looking into the courthouse could be walled off. Um, the other thing is that access to these buildings would be very much secured uh, by appointment only. And you're only talking about probably less than 50 employees in both of these buildings if they're an archive center. Um, technology, technological innovation has made archives much more easy and uh, digitization has made these collections available. And finally, uh, the location of these buildings is unique because you're right in the heart of the loop. You're in the academic center of the South Loop and it would be able to relate to people using the collections or people wanting to learn how to manage information with primary sources, which is the thing that makes history. So thank you very much for your consideration of this uh, landmark status. Thank you, Mr. McCarthy. Is there a next speaker? Uh, no more hands, please. Okay. 
Um, for the record, are there members of the general public who would like to comment on only agenda uh, five, the preliminary landmark recommendation for the consumer's building located at 220 South State? Uh, the previous uh, speakers have spoken on both item number four, the century building, as well as item number five, the consumer's building. Chairman, for some reason, we have Mr. Rolf actually is again raising the hand. But Ooh, Mr. Achilles, uh, would you like to speak on item number five? Yes. Um, uh, thank you for allowing me to speak. I, I've gotten confused with the lowering of the hand and the raising of the hand. It's, uh, I would, uh, I'm very much, I'm an art historian, architectural historian in Chicago, and I'm very much in favor of um, saving the uh, facade of the buildings in question. The terracotta is crucial at a time in uh, the early 19th, uh, 20th century when the cities were very sooty and dirty and terracotta was, uh, the white glazed terracotta was self-cleaning and bright. Uh, it's not the current case on the building in question, but the ap application of white terracotta to the outside of the building at the time that the uh, century building and the consumers building were built was novel and new. The Reliance building had done it uh, a little bit. It's uh, very elegant on the Reliance building and in a much broader sweep, the uh, consumers building and the century building used white terracotta to glow in the city, to make Chicago visible at night from uh, the new electric lights that were installed on, the, on State Street. And it made Chicago part of the city beautiful movement. The city glowed at night. The uh, two buildings in discussion are the forerunners of what we now acclaim, and very rightly so, in the Wrigley Building, which glows at night and glows all during the day. And it's the outcome, the fulfillment of the concept of glazing uh, terracotta exteriors. So saving the uh, buildings in question is important. Chicago is a skyscraper city and it's a new kind of city as we've been hearing from uh, Ad uh, Ward and Adam and others. It's a new kind of city that is comparable to Paris, which was a horizontal new kind of city in the mid 19th century. And at the end of the 19th century, Chicago, and in the early 20th century, Chicago is the vertical city in the world. And the white glazing shows it off in a way that the dark terracotta glazing doesn't. And I hope this, these become landmark buildings, if for no other reason other than to be important uh, in the history of architecture, the history of the city, and will add significantly to Chicago's opportunity for becoming a world heritage site in the downtown area for its skyscrapers. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Mr. Achilles. No other hands raised here. Okay. So I believe that's all the members of the general public who've indicated they wish to speak on agenda items. Therefore, this concludes the public comment portion of, of the meeting. Item number one is the approval of a meeting, uh, the minutes of the previous meetings. Uh, those meeting minutes were included in your packages uh, from the regular meeting of March 9th, 2023. Uh, are there any uh, comments regarding those minutes? If not, I'd like to request a motion to approve the minutes of the March 9th. 2023 uh, regular commission meeting. Is there a motion? So okay, so Commissioner Strickwitz. Uh, is there a second? Second, second. Commissioner Ponce. Okay, second, Commissioner Ponce. I'll do the uh, roll call. Commissioner Fair. Yes. Commissioner Hughes. Yes. Commissioner Rubin. Yes. Commissioner Tolliver. Yes. And I am a yes. The motion passes. Item number two is the final landmark recommendation of the Epworth Church Building, uh, located at 5253 North Kenmore Avenue. This is in the 48th Ward, uh, Alderman uh, Osterman. This is, uh, uh, I do an, announce that a public hearing was held on March 30th regarding the proposed landmark designation of the Epworth Church Building at 5253 North Kenmore. 
Uh, before I call on staff for a presentation, let me reiterate that the public hearing was the forum for introducing evidence and questions examining witnesses for the proposed designation. The commission has received copies of any received correspondence as well as the transcript and exhibits from the public hearing. However, I will allow brief comments from the property owners or their representatives should they wish to address the commission at this time. Uh, so with that, I'd like to call on Diana Cavallo to present the hearing officer's report on behalf of Commissioner Sue Ellen Burns, who served as, as the hearing officer at the public hearing. Diana. Thank you, Chairman Wong. The public hearing on the proposed landmark designation of Epworth Church was head, held virtually on March 30th at 10 a.m. The purpose of the hearing was to gather relevant facts and information to assist the commission in deciding whether the building meets the criteria for landmark designation set forth in section 2120-620 of the municipal code. Commissioner Suellen Burns was the hearing officer on behalf of the commission. Copies of the public hearing transcript and exhibits submitted at the hearing have been distributed to commission members. Originals of these documents have been made available to commission members at the Historic Preservation Division's office. The commission staff presentation recommending the proposed landmark designation was given by Matt Crawford of the Historic Preservation Division staff. At the conclusion of the staff presentation, the commission's rules and regulations allow property owners to become parties to the hearing and question the staff's presentation. The owner of the building is Church Properties Reimagined of the Northern Illinois Conference of the United Methodist Church. A representative of the owner requested and was granted party status to the hearing. The owner testified that their goal is to convert the building into 100% affordable housing. He further stated that the owner supports landmark designation of the building with the exception of its windows and doors. A potential partner in the proposed conversion of the building into affordable housing was also granted party status. His testimony provided additional information on the conversion of the building to affordable housing. Three members of the general public made statements, including two representatives of Preservation Chicago and one representative of the Edgewater Historical Society. All were in support of landmark designation. A representative of 48th Ward Alderman Harry Osterman's staff also made a statement in support of the landmark designation. Altogether, 11 members of the general public attended the hearing. The total length of the hearing was 58 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Deanna. Uh, I'd like to call on Matt Crawford for the presentation and staff recommendation. Or Joyce, you do? Oh, thank you. Matt. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, this is Matt. Um, Joyce is pulling up the show. So commissioners, having concluded the public hearing, we may now consider a final landmark recommendation to council for Epworth Church, which consists of the church building from 1891 at left and the community house addition from 1930 at right. Epworth is located at Berwyn and Kenmore Avenue, seven miles north of the loop in the Edgewater community area. At your meeting on July 7th last year, this body preliminarily found that Epworth meets four criteria for landmark designation. These include criterion one for heritage. And part of Epworth's heritage value tells us about how Edgewater developed. This rendering of the church from 1889 depicts Epworth as a picturesque church that would look at home in the English countryside. This design reflects Edgewater's first phase of growth as a, leaf, as a leafy suburban residential development that attracted Victoria and Chicago. Another aspect of heritage is the shared social values that brought Epworth to fruition. First, the land on which the church the building sits was granted to the congregation by John Cochran, the developer of Edgewater. Second, the design of the building was donated by Frederick Townsend, a congregation member who was also an architect. And third, Funds for its construction were raised from the community, and many who gave were not original members of the congregation. Epworth's heritage, like most houses of worship in Chicago, 
reminds us of the important role that religious institutions played in the social fabric of our neighborhood. In, it, in addition to heritage, the commission preliminarily found that Epworth also needs to plan for, for architecture. It's rare for its granite field stone walls, likely unique in Chicago. As you've heard, the stone would ship via Lake Michigan Barge from Racine, Wisconsin, to appear at the end of Berlin Avenue. Left in the natural state, the granite field stones lend the building visual input. This type of wall construction also requires tremendous skill in traditional masonry design and construction. Here's the gabled front of the church building, framed by a 65 foot tall bell tower to the north and an octagonal tower to the south. The entrance portico is from a 1940 renovation and is built of cast stone with Romanesque detail. The buttress side elevations have Joliet limestone window bays with art glass casement windows. As noted earlier, the second architectural element of Epworth is the tradition known as the community house. The complementary design from from the Chicago firm of Fielbar and Fugar. It was completed in 1930 to address the needs of the growing congregation for more space. The community house features crisp cast stone window bays. Cast stone is a refined form of concrete cast in custom molds to knit carved stone, and it was a very new material in 1930. The entrance at left was rendered with Gothic towers while the window bay at right features a corbel table of Romanesque design. With respect to the architects, the commission has preliminarily found that both the designer of the church and the architects of the 1930 edition all meet the five. In addition to Epworth, notable works by Townsend in Chicago include five houses on Avers, a Chicago landmark district, which is attributed entirely to Townsend. The Groats of Your House, a prominent building in the Arlington Deming District, and the reconstru reconstruction of the South Tower of Scottish Rite right, Cathedral in the Washington Square District. These are all well detailed 19th century works in the virus style of architecture. A generation after Townsend, the partnership with Fieldard and Fugard designed a community house at Epworth as well as significant works in Chicago, including the Trustees System Service Building and the McGraw Hill Building, both designated Chicago landmarks. Finally, the Commission has preliminarily found that Epworth needs to be seven as a unique visual feature. It's a very rare building, probably unique. An example of field stone wall construction in Chicago and the picturesque tower to establish Epworth as a, establish Epworth as a familiar visual feature in its neighborhood context. We also found that Epworth meets the separate integrity criterion. Though its original suburban setting has changed at 131 years old, Epworth possesses excellent integrity of design and materials. The comparison of the circa 1920 photo at left with the current view shows that the major changes include the community house addition and the added entrance narthex, both from 1930 and both having a huge significance in their own right. Your vote in July preliminary, preliminarily found that the significant historical and architectural features of that work be identified as all exterior elevations, including roof lines of the building, which includes the church and the community house. So based on what we've heard at the public hearing about the potential adapting, about the potential of adapting Epworth to new uses, staff recommends that the commission add language to the significant historical and architectural features as follows. For the purposes of section 2120-740 of the, of, the, of the municipal code governing the review of permit applications, the following additional guidelines should also apply. The commission's review of proposed work should ensure that significant historic and architectural features of the building are preserved while allowing reasonable change and flexibility 
to meet continual needs, whether related to the continued current uses of the building or an accommodation of future uses. In particular, the commission may approve modifications to existing windows and doors at Upwork to meet code required light and vent requirements. The foregoing is not intended to limit the commission's discretion to approve other changes. So that concludes my presentation. I believe Alderman Osterman is here. I can see if he was representing uh, Captain Mike Jones is also here, who represents the owner of the property. Happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Uh, does the commission have any uh, questions for Matt at this time? If not, I will uh, ask uh, Pastor Jones, would you like to make a comment, sir? Pastor Jones? Yes, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, first of all, I'd like to say after our last meeting, we met with uh, Deanna Cavallo and Matt Crawford and uh, came about a solution for the windows and doors. Uh, previously, we'd been asking that those would not be landmarked, uh, but we came about a solution with them that appears is going to work for the reuse of the building. And uh, we are planning uh, to use the building for affordable, 100% affordable housing is the direction we're moving in. And also, uh, we have been talking with Cornerstone Outreach, uh, who was looking at another location in the city, which fell through uh, due to e EPA concerns at that property. So we're also in conversation with them of possibly uh, converting the building into uh, housing uh, for people that have difficulty finding housing in the city with separate apartments and also then social services. So we'd be looking at either a 100% affordable housing or working with Cornerstone to expand availability of housing for those that find housing difficult in the city. Thank you, uh, Pastor Jones. Um, uh, Alderman Osterman, would you like to say a few words? I would, and I apologize. Alderman, you're kind members of members of the too. committee, you, Mr. Chairman. Um, um, can you hear me now? We can. Go ahead. Um, I would ask the commission's approval on final uh, landmark designation for Epworth Church. Um, Epworth is a critical part of the Edgewater community and has been for over 100 years. Um, as was mentioned earlier by one of the speakers, it's been the heartbeat of the Berwyn, Kenmore, Winthrop area for a long, long time. Um, I appreciate the staff, uh, Dijana and uh, Matt Crawford, both for the work that they've done. Um, we think landmarking this historic building uh, is critical for our community and also putting language in there that would allow for an adaptive reuse where we think is that would be possible. So um, I appreciate the, the commission's consideration and would uh, respectfully on behalf of my community, uh, ask your support for uh, landmark designation. Thank you, Alderman. Does the commission have any questions for uh, Pastor Jones or, okay, uh, uh, Commissioner Rubin, go ahead. Uh, first of all, I should just say that as a resident of the uh, Edgewater community, I'm very excited to see uh, this come up um, for consideration. It's a wonderful building. Um, I was wondering if we could hear a little bit more about the um, the uh, proposed plan for the uh, doors and windows, since you mentioned that you'd come to some type of a, um, an understanding on that. And also kind of within that, I was curious if the uh, original tracery is still under the um, under the coverings uh, in the in the circular windows in the in the front tower. Thank you. Matt, is that something you can address? Yeah, for sure. Um, so essentially, the windows in the community house at right are single pane steel frame windows um, that are really deteriorated. Um, and 
non-operable. Basically, they're corroded shut. Um, so if this building is converted to residential, what is needed is an operable window um, and adequate light. And so the flexibility here is that, of course, if uh, an owner or applicant comes forward and says, well, we want to restore the steel sash, that's great. We can do that. If uh, application comes forward and says, well, we, we can't afford to do that. Um, we feel that we have a visually compatible replacement window that is operable, that matches the divided light appearance of the steel sash. We think that is something that we could recommend to, to you as, a, as an approvable replacement window that's visually compatible that will achieve light and bang. There are also in the church, in the basement, which you can't see from the sidewalk, and you can't see from this photograph, um, windows set in light wells that um, um, light the basement. Again, if that area is converted to residential, they will need to have, uh, they are also steel sash and they're also corroded shut. They will need to have an operable window there. So we would be looking at visually compatible replacement. Um, so that's all the clear glazing windows. The other windows that are on the side of the church, lighting the nave, those are art glass windows. So it's a tinted glass set in a geometric pattern. Those windows appear to be fixed, but I, I am suspicious that the original condition you know, this was built before air conditioning, but those windows were designed to be operable. So we've asked uh, the applicant to explore um, whether these, while they appear to be fixed, whether these actually could be returned to an operable condition to achieve ventilation for uh, a residential conversion. So that's what, what we're thinking. Um, and that's what the additional language is, is meant to address some of the we think valid concerns that were brought up by the owner at the public hearing on March 30th. As to the tracery surviving behind in those oculus windows and the towers, I don't know the answer um, to that question. Thank you very much. So related to the windows in the tower, this is Mike Jones, uh, where they have the wood that you can see there, the wood, uh, circular covers. Uh, the windows behind those towers have completely deteriorated and pretty much fallen out uh, of that that section, and that's why those have been covered up with wood uh, with the symbols. So there's really not anything in the tower there uh, that exists or is preservable. Okay, uh, Commissioner Rubin, you. Uh, keep going back and forth. No, I think that was very informative. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you so much for for filling us in. Great. Are there any other questions regarding uh, this project? If not, I'd like to request a motion to adopt the final landmark recommendation to City Council for the Upworth Church Building, located at fifty two fifty three North Ken Warren. Is there a motion? So moved, Commissioner Jakovich. Okay, and a second. Second, Seconded, Commissioner, Commissioner Rubin. Uh, second, uh, uh, Commissioner Rubin actually has his hand up quickly. Uh, I'll do the roll call real quick. Um, Commissioner Fair. Yes. Commissioner Hughes. Approved. Uh, Commissioner Ponce. Yes. Commissioner Tolliver. Yes. I am a yes as well. Uh, the motion uh, passes unanimously and congratulations. Um, Alderman, thank you so much for your service over the years. Uh, item number three is a preliminary landmark recommendation for the warehouse located at 204 to 208 South Jefferson. Uh, this is in the 42nd Ward and Matt, if you could uh, let us know what's going on. Thank you, Chairman Wong. Commissioners, uh... For your consideration is a preliminary landmark recommendation for 206 South Jefferson Street, which from 1977 to 1982 housed the warehouse, a dance club with resident DJ Frankie Knuckles, 
who developed a uniquely Chicago dance music genre known as house music. The building is located near the northwest corner of Jefferson and Adams Streets in the West Loop neighborhood. We recommend that the warehouse meets two criteria for Chicago landmark designation, including criterion one as the birthplace of house music, one of Chicago's most significant cultural exports that has, a, has had a huge uh, impact on music globally to this day. The warehouse is also important to Chicago's social history as the club was initially supported by Black and Latino LGBTQ men and women who found in muffled music, community, and self-expression. Over time, the warehouse became popular with a broad range of Chicago club goers, and it was one of, few, oh, it was one of the first venues in Chicago that broke down the barrier between gay and straight club scenes. We also recommend that the building meets criterion three for its association with the late Franklin Knuckles, the warehouse's pioneering resident DJ from 1977 to 1982. In addition to being to DJing, Knuckles was a prolific record producer for major musicians, and he was also a Grammy winning remix artist. The story of the warehouse begins with music promoter Robert Williams, a New Yorker who grew up in that city's disco club culture. He came to Chicago in 1973 and established Us Studios. And there's a little bit of a lack of clarity about whether it's meant to be Us Studios or US Studios. Um, but anyways, he established this studio uh, venture. And what they did is let, they uh, hosted DJ-led dance parties at a series of former industrial venues in the West Loop and South Loop in the mid-1970s. And so after moving through various temporary venues in 1977, Williams leased 206 South Jefferson Street in the West Loop for Us Studios' first permanent dance club dubbed The Warehouse. We've not found photos of the warehouse from the 1970s, but these photographs of the block of South Jefferson Street from that time show how the West Loop has really changed. Back in the 70s, it was really uh, a former industrial area that was pretty desolate. According to Frankie Knuckles, the location was perfect for the warehouse as it was far from the established entertainment districts where the clubs Black and gay clientele were really not welcome. So back to Robert Williams. He modeled the warehouse in Chicago on successful dance clubs in New York, like Paradise Garage. Attendees had to join as members of the club, but the nightly fee for attending a set was low, at about four bucks. In lieu of alcohol, fruit juice was served. The absence of alcohol allowed the club to remain open all night, which the warehouse was once a, once a week from midnight Saturday to Sunday afternoon. Finally, music was provided by a professional DJ, spinning vinyl, and reel-to-reel -reel tape. There weren't many uh, DJs in Chicago that could do this, so Williams traveled to New York to offer the DJ booth at the warehouse to two talented figures that he knew, Larry Levin and Frankie Knuckles. Levin and Knuckles had been friends since their teenage years, and both had been working as DJs since the early 70s and were established figures in New York's disco scene. Levin declined the offer, but Knuckles accepted and moved here in March 1977, actually moving in to an uh, ad hoc apartment at 206 South Jefferson, and he took over the DJ booth at the warehouse. So there he is digging in the crates for vinyl. For dance floors at the warehouse, Knuckles reassembled and extended existing songs on vinyl and tape in creative ways. Initially, disco was the foundation of house music, and that genre was at its zenith when Knuckles came to Chicago in 1977. Two years later, disco was in very sharp decline and the supply of new records were dwindling. So in the absence of new content and disco, Nichols mined African-American music traditions, including R&B, 
soul, jazz, funk, and gospel that shared with disco emotive vocals and lush orchestration. And to these tracks, Knuckles added a persistent four over four bass line to great songs that were virtually impossible not to dance to. To add beats and weave songs together, Knuckles began using analog DIY techniques. With help from sound engineer and friend Erasmo Rivera, Knuckles learned how to re-edit songs on reel-to-reel -reel tape using splicing techniques, which required excellent hand, eye, and ear coordination. Similarly, two turntables were used to mix vinyl records simultaneously over each other. In the 1980s, these analog techniques were supplemented by digital electronics, like the Roland drum machine that Knuckles used to run new rhythms, bass lines, and drum tracks underneath familiar songs to create completely new sonic versions. Knuckles projected his sounds onto the warehouse dance floor through a very powerful sound system designed by Richard Long and Associates, the national leader in club acoustics. This intense combination of Knuckles artistry with the best technology was completely new for Chicago, and it made the warehouse and Knuckles sets wildly popular. Despite the popularity of the warehouse during the 1970s and early 1980s, Chicago House remained definitively underground and ignored by mainstream media. The one exception to this was Thing, a zine published in Chicago for maybe three to four years, which was a platform for Black gay life that did extensively cover house music in each issue. Singh also ran features on house DJs, including this one on Knuckles in 1988, years before he was known to the mainstream media. After five years, the warehouse closed. In some ways, it was a victim of its own success. The crowds were just too great for the building. In 1983, Knuckles established his own club, the Power Plant on Goose Island. Robert Williams also parted ways, rebranding the warehouse as the Music Box at a new location on Lower, Lacker, Lower Wacker Drive and hired Ron Hardy, a legendary DJ as a resident. Playing on different nights each weekend, Knuckles and Hardy attended each other's sets and engaged in friendly competition that helped advance the house genre while broadening its appeal. Prior to the you know, mid-1980s, in order to hear house, you had to go to the club and hear a set. By the 1980s, we start to see records being pressed and being sold. Uh, many of these by Knuckles and other DJs. We also saw uh, house music being sponsored by Chicago radio station WBMX. They began to broadcast uh, the genre and also host live DJ sets for DJs battles. And then they were also inspiring a lot of younger DJs in Chicago, including Jesse Saunders, Vince Lawrence, Marshall Jefferson, Harley Funk, and Wayne Williams. Some of them continued to practice the art form. In 1986, Knuckles returned to New York and established his fellow DJ David Morales, Deshmix, which produced music for notable musicians, including Diana Ross, Chaka Khan, Whitney Houston, and Michael Jackson, to name a few. In 1998, Knuckles was the first recipient of the Grammy Award for the Mixer of the Year. We believe that the warehouse building also meets the integrity criterion in the landmarks ordinance. Though it was built in 1910, the building is really significant for its association with the warehouse, which was located here from 1977 to 82. And the design and the materials of the building are intact from that time. Its setting in the West Loop has changed with new development, but enough of the industrial quality of the built environment remains. So in conclusion, it would be hard to overestimate the cultural significance of the warehouse and Frankie Knuckles. Several genres of electronic dance music can trace their origins back to this building. The site also re represents Chicago's LGBTQ community. We found a sense of communion, self-expression and hope in the revolutionary music 
with Paul from the warehouse. And then the legendary and prolific dance music artist Frankie Knuckles established his career at this building, going on to be regarded as the godfather of house music. The building is in the 42nd Ward, and all the Riley's aware of this proposal. In May, this will become part of the new 34th Ward. In terms of significant historical and architectural features, we recommend that they be identified as all exterior elevations, including roof lines of the building. That's the recommendation for you. I'm happy to answer any questions and thank you. Thank you, Matt. Do, does the commission have any questions for Matt at this time? Having uh, Commissioner Hughes, please. Not a question, but a comment. Mm -hmm. What a magical place. I just, ah. Uh, the cultural significance here is just mind blowing. Um, I'll pause and let the other comments go, um, but what a magical place. Thank you, Commissioner Hughes. Um, we do have um, Avi uh, Kamiansky here. Uh, I know you spoke earlier. Would you like to make any further comments at this time? Ms. Kamiansky. Okay, he had his hand up earlier uh, and not anymore. Okay, well, with that, um, no other questions. I'd like to request a motion to adopt the preliminary landmark recommendations to the council for the warehouse. Uh, oh, moved, there, Commissioner uh, Hughes. Right. Commissioner Hughes moves. Is there a second? Commissioner Fair has his hand up. Hey, I might have had a question before we uh, oh, <laughs> move to. Yeah, I, I hate to ahead. be that guy. No, that's um, fine. Go ahead. No, it was more so maybe a question for Matt. Um, and I just wanted to, you know, confirm. So this is really focusing on the facade, the elevations on the roof line. I think we heard earlier from I think the owner or the occupant that the interior is no longer. Um, you know, it's, it's a different function now, it's office space. Is that, that correct? Yeah, that's my understanding, Commissioner. Um, when this became the warehouse- I, I apologize before I couldn't, my mouse got lost on me and I couldn't unmute myself. Yeah, I, I can let Mr. Kamiansky go in too and what his intentions are for the interior. When, when this became the warehouse, it was a three, three-story club environment, the main dance floor being the first. And what they, you know, if you read interviews with Frankie you Nuggles, know, what it was is it went, went around to that loft-like interior, painted everything black. And the experience was all about the sound system and a lighting system. And the sound system was tremendously powerful and tremendously well-designed. Knuckles learned how to control it. And the lighting system was, as you can imagine, any, any type of disco lighting system. Um, I, I don't believe any of that, any of those fixtures or equipment survive in the interior. Um, and the reason I think that none of that survives is that the building currently houses offices. And I think uh, Mr. Kamiansky, uh, his intent was to continue the office type environment, but I'll let him explain more what his intention is. Mr. Kamiansky, go ahead. Sure. Um, again, my name is uh, Avi Kamiansky. I'm one of the owners at 206 South Jefferson now. Um, we, we, the office, the building currently houses offices. There's some law firms, solo law firms on the first level and uh, a a, um, some kind of a uh, engineering company or an architect firm that was up uh, higher up, or insurance company, I'm sorry, on the second floor. And our intent was to keep it as an office building and uh, to just do a refresh inside. Um, but the inside, there's no, there's no evidence of there being any dance floor or anything remained from the inside. It's just offices and we plan to use it as offices. And as I was saying before, most of our, for, a lot of our firm are Kent, Chicago Kent alumni. And if you, the opposite, the picture that you see right there is the law school that's taken from in front of the, from the side of the law school at Chicago Kent. So, uh, um, you know, we, 
we plan to work with the commission on this issue and uh, we're not looking to impede anything of cultural significance here. Yeah, great. Does that uh, Yeah, that, that, that does answer the question. And maybe I had, you know, just kind of a, a part two maybe for, for Matt and Deanna's team. Um, you know, just thinking about the area um, and, you know, how much it's just densified over the last, you know, few decades. Um, you know, I think that's like the, the Lulu's Tacos or the, uh, used to be, I think, Al's Beef or something like that before. Uh, but, you know, just thinking of what it means to really protect this building, uh, you know, in the event that, you know, its neighbor goes away, becomes a larger structure, just wanting to kind of tease out what what that may mean, how well that protects, you know, this building that, you know, may, may become kind of the, you know, three-story, you know, building kind of amongst, you know, six or seven-story buildings that neighbor it. Um, any, any thought been given towards that? Well, I think part of the reason that we, we moved quickly on this designation was before I had an opportunity to talk to the owners and what their intentions were, we really didn't know what the intentions were. And if you look around this building, uh, the one story to the right, and then wrapping around the corner, uh, other two and three story buildings, a very low density type area so that if those were all assembled, you could have a very tall tower development. But with the with a landmark designation of a warehouse, if it uh, does become a reality, the warehouse building will be protected um, so that um, we, we can protect that building, but we cannot in our current landmark zones, we don't have the ability to enact controls on the built environment around the actual landmark. If that answers the question. That does. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Kahn. Thank you, uh, Matt. Actually, I did have one uh, comment that I wanted to make too, uh, uh, Mr. Kamiansky, is that. Um, you know, in talking about this project with uh, Commissioner Cox a couple of days ago, we were talking about the resources that are available uh, to you as you're doing your renovation and um, uh, for your office spaces. Uh, it would be uh, really an opportunity to, to, to really identify the cultural significance of what happened at this building. Um, there are some folks over at DKs that are cultural curators uh, that that could help you out and actually find funding to uh, to help you out with with doing something if you want to go that route uh, to really celebrate the history of this building and celebrate the uh, the significance of of what has happened here. Uh, so I, I urge you to uh, have some further discussions about that. Uh, there are a number of people at the Department of cultural affairs and special events that would be able to help you with that, um, as well as a number of artists that are doing some amazing things. Uh, uh, I think this is a great opportunity for you to, to look at as you're, as you're doing your renovations. There is a motion on the table. Is there a second? No, second it, uh, Commissioner Fair. Commissioner Fair. I'm going to do the roll call, uh, Commissioner Jekwitz. Yes. Commissioner Pugs. Thank you. Commissioner Ponce? Very excited to say yes. <laughs> Commissioner Rubin? Absolutely, yes. Uh, Commissioner Tolliver? Yes. And I'm a yes as well that uh, the motion passes unanimously. Uh, good luck to you, and uh, we look forward to uh, celebrating this. OK. Um, Prior to the hearing uh, on items number four and five, um, I want to state that I directed staff to bring the Century and Consumers Buildings back to the Commission for Landmark Consideration at this meeting. Last year on July 7th, staff gave us an informational presentation regarding the buildings due to the March uh, 2022 approval of $52 million for their demolition in the Federal Appropriations Act. At that time, the commission approved a resolution directing staff to prepare preliminary summary 
of information reports for the Century and Consumer Buildings. Staff presented their reports and findings at the September 8th, 2022 Commission meeting. At that meeting, I did not call for a vote on the preliminary landmark recommendation acknowledging that the staff reports clearly established uh, clearly established the criteria for potential landmark recommendations, but that given the unusual circumstances of these federally owned properties, the commission needed more information regarding the perceived safety issues to be able to initiate a, des a designation process that would help the buildings to be rehabilitated in a way which would provide reasonable and necessary security for the courthouse to the West. I am now satisfied that it's time for the commission uh, to move forward with considering a preliminary landmark recommendation for the uh, century and consumer buildings. And I'll be calling for a motion on these two items separately later in the meeting. But before we move to hear staff presentations regarding each building, I'd like to hear from staff regarding what has been happening since September including any additional information regarding the buildings and safety criteria the commission should be aware of. Uh, Candlin, if you could do that for us, that'd be great. My pleasure. Okay, so um, since the, good afternoon, first of all, this is Candlin Hahn. Um, and since the September 8th commission meeting of last year, the General Services Administration, the independent agency which manages the federal government's real estate holdings, has begun the Section 106 process. Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966 requires federal agencies carrying out, assisting, funding, permitting, licensing, or approving projects to consider the effects of those projects on historic properties. A finding of adverse effects requires further consultation, including exploration of measures to avoid, minimize, or mitigate adverse effects. The review process gives interested parties the chance to weigh in on these matters before a final decision is made. Once federal funds were allocated for demolition of the properties at 202 through 220 South State Street, this undertaking triggered a Section 106 review. Commission staff are participating as certified local government representatives, and many of the people who testified at the beginning of this meeting are participating as representatives of their organizations. Commission staff have attended all five meetings since the process began in November of last year. For context, here is a map showing the blocks between Jackson and Adams and from State to Clark Street in Chicago's Loop. The buildings at 202 through 220 South State Street, which Chairman Wong noted are proposed for demolition, are circled in the orange dashes at the upper right. The Century Building is outlined in yellow at the very corner, and the Consumers Building is outlined in yellow at Quincy. Directly to the west, the long rectangle is the U.S. Dirksen Courthouse. The courthouse and all buildings shown in green are owned by the federal government. GSA has retained architects who have conducted condition assessments on these four State Street buildings and are in the process of drafting reports. From what they have shared, we understand that essentially the Century Building at 202 and the Consumers Building at 220 appear to be structurally sound, but do have considerable exterior cladding issues. The building at 214 also appears to be sound, but the GSA has shared that the building at 208 through 212 has condition issues that necessitate its demolition. That building's original 1920s facade was removed during its 1950s facade remodel, and this was subsequently covered over in the 1990s, so there are no significant historic features remaining. GSA's architects shared that they are taking steps to ensure that the demolition will not negatively impact the adjacent structures, including hand demolition, vibration monitoring, and ground stabilization measures. Structures are already in place blocking off the sidewalk to protect, protect pedestrians, and the demolition will likely take place later this month. Later this year, GSA plans to remove the fire escapes and portions of the parapets from the remaining three structures. GSA plans to store the exterior parapet level terracotta it removes and will be coordinating with the State Historic Preservation Office as they undertake this work. 
The Section 106 process will continue throughout 2023, and GSA has said they hope to conclude the process in January of 2024 with the signed Memorandum of Agreement. Staff will continue to be involved, but at this point, the GSA is assessing three preliminary alternatives in their charge to address federal security standards and needs for the Dirksen Federal Courthouse to respond to congressional attempts and effectively manage federal assets. The first, as you've heard, is demolition. The second is viable adaptive reuse. Re rehabilitation or modification of some or all of the properties may be considered if they can meet the security needs of the Dirksen Courthouse. And a list of reuse criteria has been developed in collaboration with the United States District Court, Northern District of Illinois, and federal law enforcement agencies. The third uh, option would be no action, um, which is simply leaving the buildings as is. Here are the 15 criteria provided by GSA, which would need to be met for any viable adaptive reuse. These were included in your packets. The commission may consider additional guidelines to accommodate these criteria as it considers whether to preliminarily designate the Century and Consumers Buildings. This concludes my status update. Thank you, Kendallin. Does the commission have any questions of Kendallin at this time? Seeing none, I'd like to um, uh, state that we received statements from the GSA and from Chief, Chief Judge Rebecca R. Paul Meyer regarding both buildings, which I'd like to read for the record. First is the letter from Regina Nally, Historic Preservation Officer of the GSA for the Great Lakes Region. Letter reads as follows. GSA provides the following statement regarding the Commission of Chicago Landmarks proposed preliminary landmark recommendation for the Century and Consumers Buildings uh, located respectively at 202 and 220 South State Street in Chicago, Illinois. As stated in our previous letter to the Commission in, in September 2022, GSA has long acknowledged the historic and architectural significance of these historic properties. We recognize that these two buildings are identified as contributing properties under criteria A and C at the local level of significance to the National Register of Historic Places listed Loop Real Retail Historic District. As such, local significance is acknowledged and considered during the consultation process required by the Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. Also stated previously, GSA is formally neutral on the Commission's proposal to designate the buildings as landmarks under the Commission's criteria. As a neutral party, GSA can best facilitate the Section 106 process and work with our consulting parties towards an agreement on the future of the properties that align with federal needs and requirements. The Section 106 consulting party discussions are underway. Our plan is to seek a final agreement by December 2023. We value the input of all consulting parties involved in the Section 106 effort, including the City of Chicago Department of Planning and Development. The expertise of City of Chicago participants in this consultation process will greatly assist us in seeking agreement among the parties in the future on the future of these properties. We appreciate the opportunity to address the commission. Uh, the next letter is from um, Judge Rebecca R. Palmeyer. She is the Chief Judge of the Northern District of Illinois, and the letter reads as such. Thank you for notifying the court that uh, at its April 13th, 2023 meeting, the Commission of Chicago Landmarks will be considering preliminary landmark designation of the 202 and 220 South State Street properties. Um, the court offers the following statement for the record. The Dirksen Courthouse is located just feet away from the two properties under consideration. This courthouse is the only one ever designed by renowned designer Ludwig, Ludwig Mies van der Rohe and, it's, and is the largest federal courthouse in the nation. It houses not only the district and bankruptcy courts for the Northern District of Illinois, but also the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Seventh District Circuit, the U.S. Attorney, and additional federal government offices. The Dirksen Courthouse is a significant contributor, contributor to activity in Chicago's downtown. Some 1,200 employees and thousands of members of the public 
visit the courthouse every week, each week to serve on juries, to be sworn in as new citizens, and to conduct criminal and civil litigation in this courthouse. A note on the history of the properties. Congress appropriated funds for the purchase of the two properties, as well as the two small buildings between 202 and 220 by the G uh, General Services Administration in 2005. The specific purpose for this purchase was to protect the courthouse by creating a security buffer zone. Specifically, the Congressional Budget Justification for fiscal year 2005 authorized GSA to acquire additional land for the purpose of increased security by eliminating the possibility of private sector development proximate to the Dirksen Courthouse. In 2005, when the properties were acquired, GSA expected that they would be, uh, they would be used to fill an anticipated need for federal office space in Chicago. In the years since then, GSA's need for tenant space has declined, but the need for a security uh, buffer has greatly increased. Congress passed the 2002 Consolidated Appropriations Act with funding to demolish the four properties, thus fulfilling the intention of the 2005 purchase. Since the last time that we communicated with the Commission on Chicago Landmarks, the General Services Administration has begun the Section 106 process mandated by the National Historic Preservation Act to address the future of the buildings at 202, 208 to 212, 214, and 220 South State Street. This includes a public scoping meeting in November of 2022, defining the 15 security criteria applicable to any viable adaptive reuse of the properties. As part of the Section 106 process, GSA has identified consulting parties and conducted several meetings with those consulting parties. More recently, GSA has prepared a conditions assessment report and has determined that the building located at 208 to 212 State Street has such significant structural issues that immediate demolition is necessary to ensure public safety. The Section 106 process is ongoing. We understand the draft environmental impact statement will be published this month, and an estimate of the cost to rehab the buildings is scheduled to be issued in May. An additional consulting party meeting is scheduled for later this month, focused on a discussion of security concerns. In short, the Section 106 process is underway, but far from complete. A record of decision is scheduled for February 2024. We note suggestions that the court should consider security enhancements that may be adequate to address the court's safety concerns. Media reports have suggested that those concerns are limited to sight lines into the courthouse from the buildings at issue. We can assure you that while sight lines are significant, law enforcement experts have identified several additional concerns. We also want to assure the commission and our security assessments conducted by public and private organizations have devoted substantial attention to alternate, alternative measures. Available security enhancements uh, are limited by the size, structure, and setting of the Dirksen Courthouse. Many of the proposed modifications are not possible for reasons relating to construction and design of the courthouse and limitations imposed by our courthouse own listing on the National Register of Historic Places. We are also aware that other federal courthouses are situated in downtown urban areas, sometimes in close proximity to other buildings. We are not able to disclose specific mitigating efforts in place at other courthouses, many of them adopted for structures built in more recent years or with different construction means or methods. Similarly, we are not able to disclose specific security concerns relating to our own Dirks and courthouse. No two buildings are alike. Every courthouse has different threat assessments based upon not only the circumstances of their construction, their geographic boundaries, physical access, and the nature of the courthouse activities. We remain committed to participating in the Section 106 process with GSA, our neighbors, tribal leaders, historic preservation organizations, and other consulting parties. Allowing the State Street properties to stand vacant indefinitely is a resolution that satisfies no one. We therefore look forward to reviewing proposals for any viable reuse of the properties that would meet the established 15 required security criteria. Um, end of letter uh, from uh, Chief Judge Paul Meyer. So with that, um, for 
Item number four of the Century Building 202, located at 202 South State Street uh, in the 42nd Ward. I'd like to call on Ken Lynn for the report. Thanks again. So the Century Building was built between 1915 and 1916 and designed by the architectural firm of Halliburton Roche. Located at 202 South State, it sits at the southwest corner of Adams and State Street. Based on evaluation of the property, Historic Preservation Division staff believe the Century Building meets three criteria for Chicago landmark designation, including criterion one for heritage. Beginning with Potter Palmer's purchase and improvement of three quarters of a mile of State Street in 1867, retail in Chicago has been centered along this thoroughfare. As the city's population grew exponentially in the following decades and the city expanded outward through annexation, Centralization of rapid transit guaranteed the business and retail dominance of the city's historic center. The 1898 map at left shows the loop of elevated tracks encircling the central business district used by multiple elevated lines branching out to different parts of the city. Demand for space in the loop exerted pressure on real estate values, which in turn encouraged maximization of return on square footage, leading to the construction of ever taller buildings. Small-scale buildings disappeared as investors saw opportunity and built large-scale speculative commercial buildings in their place, eventually giving rise to the skyscraper. The image at right shows the two four-story structures in 1903, which would be replaced with the 16-story Century Building. The Century Building is an outstanding example of a type of multi-tenant skyscraper known as a tall shops building. Tall shops buildings were speculative high-rise structures designed to serve retailers by creating interior shopping streets. Handsome edifices with lavish entries and lobbies were designed to attract and encourage potential customers to enter and circulate through the building. Elegant display cases outside and inside the ground floor allowed upper floor tenants to advertise their wares or services. The rendering on the left in a brochure promoting the new Century Building showcases the marble cladding and intricate bronze fixtures of the elevator lobby with built-in display cases at the right. On upper floors, glass corridor walls of the tenant spaces functioned like shop windows as seen in this Holliburton and Roche drawing at the upper right of a typical century building corridor. Free from the vagaries of outside weather, noise, and bustle, this early vertical version of an indoor mall allowed shoppers to move from one floor to the next as they perused goods and services. Tall shops buildings were marketed to small and mid-sized merchants, wholesalers, and service providers who desired the advantages of locating on State Street, but for whom costly street level space did not make economic sense. Tenants enjoyed the advantages of single ownership in terms of scale of operation and building management, while shared amenities within, within the building, such as restaurants, doubled as a draw for potential customers. The postcard at bottom right shows the mirrored walls of the basement level cafeteria located beneath the building's corner drugstore. The Century Building was built as a commercial investment property by the Buck and Rayner drug manufacturing and retailing firm. The company already had two corner drugstores on State Street, one at Madison and another at Randolph. The corner ground floor space at 202 gave them the third at Adams. High rise tall shops and the more ubiquitous more ubiquitous professional office buildings typically occupied compact corner lots on State Street. These tall, narrow skyscrapers contributed to the increasing density of State Street over the course of its evolution as Chicago's primary retail corridor, and together with the massive department stores occupying half or full block lots, they visually dominated the streetscape and created a distinctive street wall with canyon-like views. Staff also believe the property meets criterion five as the work of significant designers. The Century Building was designed by Chicago architects William Hollibird and Martin Roche, both of whom are recognized as innovative practitioners of the Chicago School of Architecture. Hollibird and Roche was one of the most successful and prolific architectural firms in Chicago between 1883 and 1927. By the time the Century Building was completed in 1916, the firm was responsible for 5 to 10% of the construction in the city. Holliburton Roche is one of the firms responsible for shaping the look of State Street after the turn of the 20th century. The Century Building was one in a series of their steel frame, 
white glazed terracotta buildings, which they became known for, including the now demolished Republic Building, formerly at 209 South State Street, and the extant North America Building at 36 South State Street, the Rothschild Department Store at 333 South State, and the Waterman Building at 127 South State. Over a dozen of their buildings are designated as individual Chicago landmarks, including the Old Colony, Marquette and Chicago buildings, the City Hall County Building, the Three Arts Club, and the Palmer House Hotel. Staff also found that the Century Building meets Criterion 4 for exemplary architecture. In terms of architecture, the Century Building is a commercial style building. The commercial style embodies the fundamental components of what became known as the Chicago School of Architecture. Underlying this school were the advancements in construction methods and materials, which allowed buildings to grow taller, exterior walls to open up to allow in more light, and usable interior space to be maximized with fewer columns. At 16 stories, the Century Building was considered relatively tall for its time. Its steel frame allowed large openings for windows. The frame also provided the building's structural support such that terracotta could be hung from the columns and horizontal beams to create a grid across the primary facades. Although the Century Building employs the steel frame, large window openings, and white glazed terracotta that characterized Oliver and Roche's State Street commercial buildings since 1900, it also signaled a change. The repeating narrow continuous mullions within each bay, the overall height of the structure relative to its width, and the darkened, darkening and recessing of spandrel panels so they visually recede relative to the verticals, give the facades a striking emphasis on verticality, which became central to the successor firm's skyscraper designs in the following decade. Not surprisingly, Chicago's Loop has the world's largest concentration of buildings from the Chicago School of Architecture. The Century Building represents the final years of this movement, generally considered to end with entry into World War I, where emphasis on expression of the steel frame construction gave way to emphasis on verticality and sleek linear geometry seen in much of the following decades Art Deco skyscrapers. The Century Building displays a high level of detailing and craftsmanship in the late Gothic terracotta ornamentation at the building's exterior. It was one of dozens of loop structures built in the two decades leading up to World War I, featuring white glazed terracotta cladding, and taken together, they represented the most extensive use of that wise white glazed terracotta in the city. Permits were issued for storefront changes at the Century Building in 1934 and 1944. The, the wholesale change of storefronts, indeed entire facades, has been a continuous phenomenon from State Street's earliest days. With the recovery of the economy after World War II, modernization of commercial spaces accelerated on State Street. Home Federal Savings purchased the Century Building in 1948. Non-original storefronts were replaced with a continuous storefront of regularly placed narrow floor-to-ceiling mullions, securing large plate glass windows trimmed in stainless steel. At the State Street elevation, glass panels curved to form an S-shape, arching out to align with the front plane of the building at the elevation's midpoint and intersecting with the smooth granite clad angled building entry at the south end. At the second floor, window openings were reconfigured to centered bands of fixed windows divided by stainless steel mullions aligned with the storefront mullions below. The storefront of the Century Building is an excellent example of the translation of the international style to storefront design. New open front storefronts prioritized views inside, such that the interior commercial space became the display. Tall plate glass windows were employed as both window and architectural form. The Century Building's dramatic floor-to-ceiling curving plate glass storefront trimmed in stainless steel is an example par excellence of these ideas. So the 1951 to 52 remodeling of the Century Building's first two floors, still intact today, reflects the optimism and prosperity of post-war America when new was equated with better. Like other financial institutions of the era, appearing modern and efficient was seen as a way to attract customers. The unadorned smooth lines of the international style were used to communicate this message. So the Century Building's first and second floor exteriors are especially noteworthy as a rare surviving example 
of a mid 20th century commercial storefront remodeling on State Street. In addition to the landmark criteria, we recommend that the Century Building also meets the separate integrity criterion. Viewing the first and second floor exterior alterations as significant in their own right, overall, the Century Building maintains substantial integrity. Absence of the original cornice as seen in these comparison photos is not unusual for buildings of this age and does not significantly impair the building's ability to convey its historic character. As previously noted, the terracotta exterior is in need of substantial repair and replacement, but enough remains to provide the essential visual character of the historic structure. No major additions or alterations have been made to the building since the 1951-52 remodeling, leaving most historic features and finishes and the overall form, footprint, location of entrances, and arrangement of fenestration intact. The 1950s storefront is remarkably intact. Windows and some portion of the granite cladding and the north and east elevations of the second floor have been removed, but the reconfigured window openings remain. There is photographic documentation of the remodeling and original cladding at the first floor remains to inform future restoration work. So these losses can be considered reversible. The projecting steel canopy installed above the first floor is temporary and easily removed. Staff believe that the Century Building meets criteria one for heritage, four for architecture, and five for significant architects, as well as the separate integrity criterion, and therefore recommend that the significant historical and architectural features be preliminarily identified as all exterior elevations of the building, including roof lines, and the first and second floor exteriors remodeled in 1951 to 1952. In response to the specific reuse criteria listed by the GSA to address security concerns, the commission may consider additional language to acknowledge these and provide flexibility to allow modifications to the buildings. Specifically, in light of the Century Building's adjacency to the Dirksen U.S. Courthouse and the security vulnerabilities asserted by the federal government, and in order to recognize and provide the flexibility which may be needed to accommodate the 15 reuse criteria, criteria provided by the GSA for the Century Building, which were developed in collaboration with the U.S. District Court and the federal law enforcement agencies published in the November 1 Federal Register. The following additional guidelines shall also apply to the Commission's review of permits. The Commission shall also shall have flexibility to allow modifications to the Century Building to accommodate the GSA's reuse criteria in order that viable reuse of the building can be achieved. Alderman Riley is aware of the preliminary landmark recommendation, but has not provided comments. You did receive a link, link to the large petition and dozens of emails expressing support for the designation, and I'm available to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Kendallin. Does the commission have any questions for Kendall this time? Uh, I have a question. Commissioner Tolliver. I need some clarity. If if we were to landmark this building uh, and subsequently no developer was identified who's willing to undertake the tremendous expense involved, not only in, in rehabbing the building, but meeting these 15 criteria uh, that the GSA requires, what happens to the building? The building is owned by the federal government, and ultimately they are the owners and their federal power due to the supremacy of the federal government would uh, supersede any local um, uh, ordinances. So the federal government ultimately uh, is the decision maker when it comes to the, the fate. So if we were to landmark it, this does not prevent the federal government from exercising eminent domain or whatever you want to call it based on its criteria. Like, yes, like many, many things in the United States, the federal government is ultimately, uh, yeah, the arbiter of, of what happens. Um, any other questions at this time? Is there a uh, uh, chief uh, Judge uh, Paul Meyer is not available. Does she have a, is there a representative from her? 
office. I have not seen anybody. I did not see anyone early, but please okay. speak up if you have joined us. With that, if there are no other questions, I'd like to request a motion to adopt the preliminary landmark recommendation to the city council uh, for the uh, Century Building located at 202 South State Street. Is there a motion? So moved, Commissioner Ribbon. Okay, is there a second? Second, Commissioner Ponce. Okay, it's uh, second by uh, Commissioner Ponce. Commissioner Jekowitz. Yes. Commissioner Fair. Yes. Commissioner Hughes. Heck yes. Uh, um, Commissioner Tolliver. Yes. And I am a yes as well. The motion carries unanimously. Um, let's go on to item number five is the consumers building. Uh, Kendallin. Thank you again. Okay. So built between 1911 and 1913, the consumers building was designed by Mundy and Jensen. It's located on the west side of the block between Adams and Jackson at 220 South State Street. At the time of its construction, Quincy, Quincy Street, seen here from above, with the consumers building on the right, was a through street, and both the south and east elevations of the building would have been street facing. In 1960, the city council passed an ordinance to vacate the western half of Quincy for construction of a new federal courts building stretching from Adams to Jackson. The eastern half of Quincy became a pedestrian plaza. In 2017, a barrier was put up to prevent access to the plaza. Based on evaluation of the property, Historic Preservation Division staff believe the consumer's building meets three criteria for Chicago landmark designation, including criterion one for heritage. The consumer's building was a speculative commercial building built in response to the rising value of real estate on State Street around the turn of the 20th century. Shown framed in red dashes are the lower scale structures, which would be taken down to make way for the consumer's building. Developer Jacob L. Kessner commissioned the consumer's building as a professional office building. Professional office and tall shops buildings began to increase in number after the turn of the 20th century and typically were located at corners. With smaller footprints than department stores, these structures usually reached 15 to 25 stories. Maximum advantage was taken of valuable State Street frontage, so ground floors had large storefronts. Stairs also typically led to basement spaces utilized for commercial purposes. Floors just above the ground level included large expanses of glass for display or signage, and often stairs located in lobby provided easy access. Upper floors were open and could be subdivided to provide maximum flexibility so that tenants of all sizes could find space in the building. As a professional office building, the consumer's building was intended to appeal to a mix of tenant types. Ads emphasized the flexibility of floor pans and the features with, and features with universal appeal, namely windows at all elevations, excellent elevator and janitorial services, and great location. Tenant spaces with natural light and ventilation from windows were at a premium, so Jacob Kessner purchased the property directly to the north to ensure that no building would encroach the consumer building's north elevation. Then, by centralizing the elevator floor, fenestration was possible at all elevations, and he was able to maximize square footage available with windows for lease at each floor as seen in the photo at the left. The, what was the State and Quincy Building was rechristened as the Consumers Building in 1913, named for the coal and ice delivery company which occupied the upper floors. The photo at right shows the large scale sign installed atop the building with the consumer's company name. The consumer's building is a prime example of a professional office building, a distinct building type important to the evolution of State Street, reflecting the symbiotic relationship between retail and professional services seen throughout, throughout the street's history. Lower for retail tenants generated foot traffic which brought recognition and potential customers to the location. Restaurants and other shops were conveniently located in the building for workers on the upper floors. And the higher rents, which retail tenants paid, allowed for better quality shared building services. In return, upper floor tenants provided a greater pool of likely customers for the retailers. A series of restaurants were established in the basement tenant space of the consumer's building, especially during its early history. 
the building's ground and second floor tenants during the 20s, 30s, and 40s were typically jewelers, men's and women's clothing stores, and cigar shops. The largest corner retail space was leased by New York City-based Howard Clothes as their first branch store in the Midwest from 1936 until the store closed in the 1970s. Upper floors contained a wide variety of tenants, including service providers like barbers, tailors, and furriers, retailers of items like carpets and typewriters, manufacturers, agents, insurance companies, and other small entrepreneurs, as well as schools and nonprofit organizations. Staff also found that the building meets criterion four for exemplary architecture. The consumer's building, like the Century Building, is a commercial style building in the tradition of the Chicago School. Its steel frame is expressed on the exterior by the more solid grid-like pattern of continuous narrow vertical piers and narrow horizontal spandrel bands. The overall height of the structure relative to its width, plus the widening of piers at the corners and center of the east elevation emphasize the vertical over the horizontal elements of the facade. Like the Century Building, the Consumers Building also was one of dozens of loop structures built in the two decades leading up to World War I featuring white glazed terracotta cladding. The Consumers Building displays a high level of detailing and craftsmanship in classical revival style terracotta ornamentation at the building's exterior. On the interior, the vestibule and lobby are especially noteworthy as rare surviving examples of early 20th century professional office building entry spaces. The walls and ceilings are clad in white marble with simple geometric classical revival detailing and a marble staircase is set into an alcove. Cross beams and the vestibule and lobby ceiling align with pilasters along the walls. Decorative bronze elements include door frames and lobby fixtures like baseboard grills, a building directory, mailbox, elevator detailing, and festooned sconces at each pilaster. Staff also believe the property meets criterion five as the work of significant designers. The consumer building was designed by the architecture firm of Mundy and Jensen. William Mundy and Elmer Jensen were former partners of William LeBaron Jenny, a leader in the Chicago School of Architecture. William Bryce Mundy served as architect for the Chicago Board of Education from 1898 to 1904 and became a fellow of the American Institute of Architects. Architect Elmer C. Jensen's sense of responsibility to the larger profession of architecture earned him the title Dean of Chicago Architects, and the Chicago Tribune noted he was given about every honor members of his profession in Chicago have been able to bestow. Mundy and Jensen were among the handful of important designers enlisted by auto dealers to construct new showrooms in the automobile sales and service nexus of Motor Row, located south of the Loop. Six of these are extant and located within the landmark district there. The Consumers Building was one of many loop structures designed by Mundy and Jensen, including the Municipal Courts Building, the Kessner Building, the Lemoyne Building, the Singer Building, and the Union League Club, all extant. During their nearly three decades long partnership, Mundy and Jensen were one of the most prolific architectural firms in Chicago after the turn of the 20th century, known not only for their loop skyscrapers, but also for their industrial, bank, and residential buildings, such as the Clements & Company Manufacturing Building at Division and & Homan, and the Chicago landmark West Town State Bank Building. In addition to landmark criteria, we recommend the consumer's building also meets the separate integrity criterion, there have been no major additions or alterations, so the building maintains its overall historic form and appearance, including window and entrance locations. The missing cornice, original windows, and storefronts are not unusual for buildings of this age, and it does not significantly impair the building's ability to convey its historic character. The exterior retains the majority of its architectural terracotta cladding and decoration and imparts a strong sense of its original visual character though it is in need of significant repair and some degree of replacement as the GSA has recently shared. The main entrance vestibule and elevator lobby retain an unusually high degree of integrity and are an extremely rare surviving example of an original early 20th century office building vestibule and lobby. Staff believe the consumer's building meets the criteria one for heritage, four for architecture, and five for significant architect, as well as the separate integrity criterion, 
and therefore recommend that the significant historical and architectural features be preliminarily identified as all exterior elevations, including roof lines of the building and the main entrance vestibule and elevator lobby, the lobby staircase to the second floor and the barrel vaulted staircase to the base basement, including marble finishes at walls and ceilings are included. And again, as before with the Century Building, in response to the specific reuse criteria listed by the GSA to address security concerns, additional language may be considered by the commission to provide flexibility to allow modification to the buildings. Specifically, in light of the consumer building's adjacency to the Dirksen Courthouse and the security vulnerabilities asserted by the federal government, and in order to recognize and provide the flexibility which may be needed to accommodate the 15 reuse criteria provided by the General Services Administration for the consumer's building, which were developed in collaboration with the U.S. District Court and federal law enforcement agencies and published in the November 1 Federal Register, the following additional guidelines shall also apply to the Commission's review of permits. The, the Commission shall have flexibility to allow modifications to the consumer's building to accommodate the GSE's use criteria in order that viable reuse of the building can be achieved. So again, Alderman Riley is aware of this preliminary recommendation, but has not provided comments, and you received the public comments in your packet. This concludes my presentation, and again, please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you, Candlin. Does the commission have any questions for Candlin at this time? I also um, still do not see anybody from um, Chief Judge Paul Myers' uh, office. Uh, with that, I'd like to request a motion to adopt the preliminary landmark. Commissioner Fair's hand is up. I'm sorry. Oh, Commissioner sorry. Fair. I'm sorry. Um, just a maybe a clarification just on, I think, some of the amended texts that you mentioned, Candlin. Um, you know, in, in my mind, I, I was thinking of that more so in alignment with some of the uh, ideas that we read and heard today of, you know, potentially modifying the structure for, you know, supporting archive functions and things like that. Is that, you know, roughly in alignment? I just want to make sure that that, you know, kind of doesn't go to an extreme. Uh, I think it's it's pretty clear, you know, I think the uh, architectural elements that we also want to make sure are maintained and preserved. So I just wanted to tease that out a little bit. Well, the 15 criteria that the GSA put out um, provide this path for potential viable reuse. So the language that is suggested here provides um, flexibility specific to those criteria that would allow, you know, whatever modifications were needed. The um, uh, potential reuse as the collaborative archive center knew about these 15 criteria, and I think um, actually were developed with um, the ability to accommodate those criteria. Um, and a lot of the criteria, you know, have to do with sight lines. And I have heard Preservation Chicago and other collaboration uh, members talk about, um, you know, archives not needing light. So if you are blocking windows to prevent sight lines, you're blocking light going in. So um, that was, I believe, you know, the, the major impetus behind looking at that potential reuse. So I don't see any conflict. Uh, as a matter of fact, I see a, a very convenient marriage between those accommodations and what's been put forward so far. Agreed. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Are there any other questions for Kendallin? If not, I'd like to request a motion to adopt the preliminary landmark recommendation of City Council for the Consumers Building located at 220 South State Street. Is there a motion? Uh, sorry, sorry, I had a quick question as well. Oh, go ahead. Uh, it's, it's about the process. I know it was mentioned that uh, in February of 24 is when um, the decision will be made. Are there any uh, sort of public hearings before then that uh, the commission could submit um, kind of written remarks to, or that we could appear to in person to advocate? 
Yeah, absolutely. Actually, the staff has attended every meeting and we continue to plan to participate in every one of those um, meetings. They're scheduled roughly monthly. Um, okay. And we're going to, there's going to be some opportunities for more in-depth conversation on specific subjects as the GSA has outlined it. So absolutely, um, we've, you know, submitted questions and made statements at every meeting. So we will continue to do that on behalf of the commission. Um, okay, the great. Department. Thank you, Candela. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, if no other uh, questions or comments, I'd like to call on that motion. Is there a motion? So moved. So move, uh, Commissioner Jekowitz. Is there a second? Commissioner Hughes, second. Commissioner Hughes, second. Okay. Um, Commissioner Fair. Yes. Commissioner Ponce. Yes. Commissioner Rubin. Yes. Commissioner Tolliver. Yes. And I am also a yes. The motion carries unanimously. Thank you all and thank you staff for this uh, very good and due diligence uh, that you guys have provided. Really thank appreciate you. that. We will anticipate um, probably hearing some updates informationally as we as we move along. Uh, the permanent review committee reports on um, on March 9th and Commissioner Jacquez, if you want to uh, sure. tell us what's going on. Um, the permanent review committee reviewed four projects at its March 9th, uh, 2023 meeting. All four projects were approved with conditions and the report summarizing the scope of the proposed projects and the committee's decisions was included in your packets. This report is for your information and for the record. Thank you, sir. Um, Emily, do you have the monthly report? Emily? Emily, I think you're still muted. Hello. We're, work we're working on it. We have a technical difficulty. Just a moment. Sorry about that. Sorry. Okay, I think she's about, she's about got it. Okay, Emily. Oh, sorry, Commissioner. No problem. <laughs> Just a second. Um, okay. Okay, apologies. Um, so staff reviewed a total of 182 permit applications for the month of March um, with a total of 209 reviews performed total. Um, and the average number of days to issue corrections or approval was 4.2. My goodness, that's a lot. Thank you very much. Um, any questions for uh... Emily or uh, Commissioner Jekowitz on the permit review. If none, no other further business, I'd like to request a motion to adjourn this meeting. Is there a motion? So moved. Okay, and a second. 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 <laughs> All, <right. laughs> All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Commissioner Jekowitz, what do we have? Um. Let's start at 325, if that's okay, uh, from review committee. Okay, sounds great. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.